So again, I'm Monica Somerville. I, think, I don't know if everyone heard me the first time. Um, head of the FinTech research practice at TAB, looking at how emerging technologies are impacting capital markets and asset management. Now, you only had to listen to Rob's keynote to see how the post-trade space has just been facing these dramatic changes. Um, these changes you know, are impacting the business models, the workflows, the networks in this area. But how you know, is the role of disruptive technology playing a part in all that? That is what we're going to be talking about in the next um, 45 minutes. And to help me with that, I, we have an excellent panel of market practitioners and solution providers and market infrastructures. So before we get going on the discussion, I'd like to ask each panelist to just briefly describe your role in the post-trade space, introduce yourself. Um, sure, with pleasure. So uh, Alex Powell, uh, I work for a company called Euroclear. Uh, I hope a number of you have heard of Euroclear. Uh, we run, I think, seven CSDs in Europe uh, and a very large ICSD. Uh, and perform uh, a tremendous amount of settlement. Uh, uh, so in the UK, uh, I'm responsible for our technology, uh, where we've got about 1.2 trillion pounds worth of uh, cash and stock that moves every single day, um, and that has to move correctly. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the thing that keeps me awake at night. John Pygott. Just keep talking. I think they'll okay. adjust it as you go along. This is John Pygott, um, CEO of Abe. You've, I'm certainly you've never heard of. Uh, we're a newly licensed regulated market exchange in the EU with ATS licenses through US, Canada, and most of Asia. We'll be launching in Q1. My background, both as a securities lawyer and then as founder of a company called Bond Point in 1999, which uh, was the first ATS in the United States. We were for the fixed income market. It's now ICE Bond Point, owned by Intercontinental Exchange. Did about 34% of the US bond market last year. Um, and so we're very interested in both the testing system of Exact Pro and, of course, everything happening on the continent. Thank you. Um, so I'm Richard Fenner, working for uh, the World Federation of Exchanges. We are the global voice for exchanges and CCPs. Um, that means we do advocacy with policymakers at the likes of the Financial Stability Board and IOSCO, uh, talking about the priorities for CCPs, responding to their priorities, and also uh, setting standards and, and benchmarking for our members. Hi, my name is Alexis Verf. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of ExecPro. We are a testing service provider, and our, most of our clients are financial infrastructures, uh, market infrastructure and financial services, like exchanges and clearing houses. Thank you all. So, um, John, maybe we can kick things off with you. Just to set the stage, can we talk about what you see as the real um, technological drivers that are influencing the space and what technologies in particular do you find, you know, outside of DLT, obviously, <laughs> that are affecting the space? And everyone should feel free to jump in once you've uh, had your go. Well, actually, starting on the DLT side, picking up on Robert's presentation, excellent presentation, um, the distributed ledger technology, especially technology, very powerful, can be very instrumental in helping fix a lot of the post-trade problems. The challenge with it now is you've got, first of all, a $200 billion asset class in the total universe, which is a lot of money if it's yours or mine, Monica, still not enough, but it's a good start, <laughs> right? But in terms of capital assets, of course, capital markets, it's you know, a fingernail clipping, $200 billion out of, depending on how you count it, $200 trillion to $560 trillion in the global capital markets process. And it's an asset class or way of holding things, whatever you want to call it, that has no descriptive data. The descriptive data is junk, all right? CMT is both the name of one of the largest market makers. It's the acronym for under Binance. CMT means um, crypto uh, travel miles program. Under Cryptopia, they use it for the common, the acronym for the Comet, Comet uh, offering. You have uh, trading data that is junk. Recent SEC report. Uh, analyzed all the trading for Bitcoin, for example, on 250 exchanges, Re concluded that over 97% of the trades are fake. So you can't trust the descriptive data, this inconsistent descriptive data. You can't trust the trading data. What's the use of it? Well, the use of it is uh, you now have a, what's essentially a, a self-authenticating data packet, which has been somewhat of a holy grail for a long time in financial capital markets technology. So we're really going to have to, I think we're seeing a process now where both all the players in the room 
and all those, certainly Euroclear and DTCC, the traditional players are stepping in and creating some structure for that DLT technology can be useful for, especially in post-trade. But right now, none of our post-trade systems can handle any of this data. There's no communications protocol, descriptive data is inconsistent, and the trading data is fake. That said, if you can have a data packet that can essentially authenticate itself and achieve via, without a central trusted database with, with that can achieve uh, WYSIWYS, which is what I see is what you see. So true, two traders can know affirmatively that, definitively that they are looking at the same descriptive data, the same data on the screen when they commit to a trade. That's, that's a big deal. That's worth pursuing and can fix a lot of the post-trade problems we have now. Uh, AI and ML technology, increasingly uh, applied on it, can, can sift through you know, astonishing vast quantities of data. Uh, quantum computing has a potential to you know, uh, uh, get the speed that we need to apply AI and machine-based learning technologies to, to, to come to some conclusions that are, that are useful for, like Euroclear, for example, pushing it to the back end. Otherwise, it's too much data. So I don't think we have too much data. I think, yeah, we've, yeah. Got, I think we've got a lot of data which, we've got, which we have huge opportunities to, um, to gain insights from, and that's what we, you know, we see. So a lot of the work that we're doing on the, in, in the innovation space is around data. As you can imagine, uh, uh, to your point earlier about uh, you know, can you trust the exchanges, can you trust the, can you trust the, the, the actual data? Well, within a CSD uh, like ours, where you've got a number of markets connected to us, you've got uh, uh, you know, a regulated clearinghouse provided mm -hmm. connected to us, and we are a regulated CSD, I don't think anyone's ever questioned uh, the data that we're holding on behalf of our, of our clients, which is great. That data is highly valuable because, it, for example, when you're looking at trading clearing settlement, a lot of the trading that takes place is, is, um, is high frequency trading. Uh, and uh, a number of people want to actually know, particularly when you get down to low liquidity stocks, what is the movement of that stock? How much does that stock really, really, tra really, really trade? Well, you won't find the answer to that in an exchange. You won't find the answer to that in an MTF. You'll find the answer to that in the CSD. So there's huge opportunity, and we've got you know 20 plus years of that data. Uh, so you know, and that data is 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 um, it's thorough, it's uh, it's checked, it's uh, it's real. So I think, well, to your earlier point, I think there are a number of markets and perhaps a number of areas which uh, are perhaps uh, uh, less well regulated, but certainly in the regulated industries, I think you'll find that the um, you know, the, the data is pretty trustworthy. Yeah, maybe I just would follow up uh, one point on that data, and as we think about it, looking at the regulatory side, I think definitely cloud has been one of the um, key emerging technologies where we've seen front-loaded benefits, but some of the challenges, I think, are around data policy, and I'd put in that bucket, first of all, privacy, but also data localization. How are international regulators speaking to each other about these requirements for global businesses uh, when they're making them host data in their individual jurisdictions? And I think we'll have a little question about regulation a little bit later on, so maybe we'll dive into that deeper because that's a really good point. Alexi, did you want to add anything to this uh, topic? No, I think that uh, the, the question was pretty much covered by my colleagues, but I would like to mention that uh, the, the world is going to an increasing complex situation. And if you have a tools such as uh, machine learning uh, to try to deal with this complexity, that would be a big breakthrough for the, for the industry. Because I'm talking as a tester, if we are dealing with some very efficient, a good company that uses mainframe to uh, deliver services, it's very hard to test because we cannot restart mainframe, we cannot move it to next date, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that should, that, 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 that's the thing that should be replaced anyway with some technology. Okay, so still sort of staying with this idea of laying the groundwork, um, I'm gonna start with, with Richard on this one. When you look at the trade management cycle, um, where do you think there are the most opportunities for individual technologies to really make a difference? I mean, I know we, we talk a lot about DLT and AI, um, and some of the benefits are far off, but there are some more real benefits that come from things like RPA that's happening now. So just curious, you know, if you 
call feedback on that for us? Sure. So I think about this from two perspectives. One is where are my members, the exchanges and CCPs, finding that they can add value in adjacent areas where they are well placed given their uh, assured and central node in the system? And the other is where can we solve challenges that the regula regulators are putting uh, to us? And Perhaps if we can get that slide up, I think there's a clicker there. I'm the fourth one along, um, so not there, but this one comes from our, um, yeah, that's that's the one, from our um, Future of Clearing report where we collaborated with uh, all of our Wyman and, and some of our members um, to look at some of these questions. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, data here, but I would um, uh, just highlight um, on, on that first point on um, OTC bilateral um, margin requirements. We have those coming in, and I think that's an area in particular where we're going to be seeing uh, CCPs able to add value to their members, um, both in terms of the um, standardization of, of how that happens, facilitating those services, but also in terms of uh, margin optimization. Um, and, and that is going to require a heavy tech lift, I think, from the clients. Um, and as well with us uh, supporting them. Um, the other side that I, that I would mention, responding to regulators, I think there's a lot still to be done around trade reporting, and um, certainly in, in the US we've seen there is the uh, consolidated audit trail, which has posed challenges in terms of uh, technology delivery. Um, and one of the areas in the EU that we're looking at is on the market data side. So we've had some consultations recently from ESMA about how a consolidated tape uh, will be delivered. Uh, we see that there may be a potential use case in a consolidated tape of record uh, being delivered in Europe and helping address some of those uh, challenges that uh, MIFID II was uh, trying to solve around fragmentation of markets. Uh, well, the, the, the question I would have, and what I think we're all going to have to face as uh, both the CCPs and exchanges as industry is, is there really a use case, and I'd love to hear the panelists' comments on this, is there a use case for being able to query a data packet representing a security or an asset, a financial instrument, that can then tell you where it's been, when it was created, what its attributes are, and who has owned it at what points, at what price, without having to ping CCP or DTCC or other descriptive databases to confirm that. I mean, is there a use case in that? Because that's one of the uses that the technology has. It's pretty unique. But I don't see anybody using that yet. You see any demand for that? Yeah. Um, I think that it's just a question of trust. So you, you build the machine that provides you trust that this is not fake fake asset, but it's a real, something real, and that can be traded, can be exchanged with others. And this trust is uh, maintained by the, the community and not some central server. Yeah. It, is there a demand for a peer-to-peer -peer querying of that without going back into a central server? I mean, is there, do you think there's consumer demand for it? Or has all that utility already been solved by our current kind of centralized database? market structure? I think if you will increase the complexity of it, if you add smart contracts to it, then it will be a great value. So Alexei, I might just stay with you because this is, this is sort of a, a good next question. You know, emerging technologies by definition, um, <laughs> relatively immature, right? So how does that, um, you know, how much confidence is there in this new technology really is it resilient enough? How does it affect the testing? How do you approach that? Yeah, I think that as any technology that should serve financial services, it must be tested thoroughly. And I think that there, there should be two parallel streams of testing. First of all, the lab testing with test environments, a lot of functional, non-functional resilience testing. And another part is live testing when you put up some POCs, some live markets, test markets to, for people to play. To, to try to this technology, to try these technologies, and uh, regarding the resiliency, what I believe is that uh, if we are talking about DLT, which is replacing a central repository with a network, it should 
be much more resilient because of the network structure. And there is a notion that networks are more, more resilient than, than cent centralized nodes. But uh, for any specific network, it must be proved and tested. And that's what we must do. Um, and a couple more qu points about the testing. These new technologies, for example, these DLT technologies, there are certain features about these technologies. First of all, there will be much closer uh, communication or even much closer integration be between trading and post-trade. So I, I think that at some point when these technologies evolve, we should test uh, trading systems and post trades as one system, not as two separate systems like it happens today. So it's, it's, it's one of the big obstacle, not obstacle, big, big challenges for us in testing. And the second thing that is, that system become more and more open. As I mentioned, these smart contracts or APIs allow inter members interact with this. So this post-trade system may become more, more like uh, the high frequency exchanges that use high frequency trader when uh, members uh, are using APIs and even write code for smart contracts to interact with the systems. And this has to be tested much more thoroughly than it does now for classical clearing, clearing systems. I mean, just obviously, again, we're talking a lot about DLT. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about testing around AI technologies as well. Um, <laughs> there's lots of considerations there, aren't there? Really? Well, testing, we, we're using AI for testing. Yeah. And of course, we sometimes encouraged with need for testing for AI. But this is not a very, very new technology because it's, it's already in the market for some time. So it's uh, just. You need to have to have specific tools like statistics to be able to test the AI. But, so, but I think that the the biggest change, as you mentioned, that it, this will be a tokenizing or uh, creating the digital assets and digital currencies that should be tested. Um, you know, we've already talked about some use cases. So I was wondering if we could maybe dive into um, some real life use cases for some of this emerging technology. You know, Alex, Richard, I don't know if you want to share with us some of the things that you're doing where you're actually making use of all this exciting tech. Sure. I mean, of, of course, uh, you, know, you know, we, we like, uh, like, like other market infrastructures like the DTCC, we have an innovation team. Uh, we're looking at using, you know, we're deploying a lot of the new newer technologies uh, around the place. Uh, and similarly, you know, the themes are quite similar. So, you know, RPA, we use a lot in our operations functions, as you can imagine. Um, I have a personal view on RPA in that it's really a sticking plaster solution. It's, sort, it, it's done because it, it, systems don't talk to each other. Uh, and it's probably, you know, cheaper to stick the sticking plaster over it and, you know, screen scrape off one system and stick it into another system than actually um, solve the, the, the integration problem uh, that's fundamental and probably more costly to do that. Uh, but nonetheless, it has its uses. Uh, you know, we're looking, we're, as I said earlier, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time looking at uh, big data analytics, uh, monetize, how can we make better use of the data that we have for the benefit of our, of our customers. Um, for example, um, there's new regulatory directives in Europe coming up on, uh, on shareholder rights and being able to identify who is the underlying, um, who is the underlying beneficiary. So we have a lot of that data. We don't have all of that data in the value chain, uh, but we have a lot of that data and we can provide that very, 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 very easily. Uh, there's also a new uh, regime coming up in Europe around uh, settlement discipline. So in other words, if you're settling securities, uh, you will get, there will be a new regime around fining uh, if you fail to settle and buy-ins as a result of that settlement. And of course, a number of our clients who, you know, we, you know, we've got a lot of data and a lot of historical evidence about what our clients are doing. And of course, we can help them through the data analytics to work out, you know, to, to identify areas where they may find themselves in a difficult position to actually do perform a settlement. And, uh, you know, that will, that sort of settlement preemption to help them avoid paying the penalties by positioning their securities in the right place before settlement, which typically takes place in our market and like the DCC, T plus two, um, uh, for most securities, then uh, that, that really, really helps. So again, lots of lots going on on the big data space. Um, 
I think there has been some talk about DLT. I'll perhaps talk a little bit more about my own personal views on that later on um, uh, in the panel. But uh, just for now, you asked the question about you know, what's going on, what are we doing? Uh, we're, we're doing a lot that's uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the security space, as you can imagine. Uh, we, we're working uh, with uh, public knowledge, with the European Investment Bank, on uh, how, to, how to, to create a central source of issuance using DLT for Euro commercial paper. Uh, so that's a, a big initiative that we've got with Santander Bank, with, uh, with the EIB, and so on. Uh, and there's another one which I, I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to talk about in, in a lot more detail, but I will say it's around the, the issuance space. But if you, look at, if you look at settlement today, settlement in Europe, is that the problem? Is, is that actually a problem? What does it cost? It costs, you know, it costs the end investor absolutely peanuts, right? It's, 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 you know, it's not on the scale. You've got management fees, you've got trading fees, you've got exchange fees, you've got CCP fees, and then finally you've got settlement fees, you've got custodian fees, you've got the cost of money. Um, you know, our fraction, our, our take on it is absolutely minuscule. We are, we are, um, we can prove this, we are the cheapest uh, CSD in, in Europe. And, uh, and so, actually, what's the problem? Um, you know, there isn't a problem uh, to be solved by DLT in this particular case. Um, there are other areas where DLT can make a difference, but I don't think, I don't think it, in this case. So, um, anyway, I'm talking about some of the opportunities we're looking at probably a little bit too long, but I'll hand over to one of my other colleagues now. So. Now, I, I've, always, I've always wanted to take a couple of days off and chart the, um, the emergence of the business models that claim to be the DTCC killer, the, um, the, the distributed technology, distributed ledger technology is going to take over the global financial system. If you chart that out, I'm absolutely convinced. If you did chart that out, it would parallel perfectly with the legalization of marijuana through the United States. That there's this parallel, very really tight line. I'm convinced of. For those of us who have been around the financial markets for a while, and I'll admit that I was, I wrote my. How many people wrote code on index cards? Like literally, <laughs> physically index cards that you fed in a machine, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Those of us who are still using a walk, they're already using a walker to get up and down, right? Um, so I've been going to these crypto and blockchain conferences and ICO conferences for the last five or six years, and I've always been the one in the back. As a former securities lawyer and some person who's running an exchange, I'm always texting to the SEC in the back, like, please arrest everyone in the building, <laughs> like literally everyone, because. There's all this talk about how, you know, the, to Robert's point earlier, that the, the big pitch for blockchain has been, we've been using, uh, we have no fractionalized ownership of assets. We've been using paper to represent stock certificates, and there's no easy, efficient way to transfer uh, financial assets. Well, the Dutch did their first asset back in, I think, 1807, right? We, so that's fractionalization of ownership. We, to, uh, in, was it DTC, originally it was 1973 when we made stock certificates electronic. And in terms of clearing and settlement, I'd love to see the inefficiency. I mean, I'm, my whole career has been built on disintermediating and creating efficiency, but, and I would love to see it as a personal profit opportunity, but I don't see it. I would, I want, I've been looking for it for 20 years. So the challenge now, I think, is, is if this is an asset class or technology that is proving itself, and I do think it has some unique characteristics that are useful, particularly in post-trade, in terms of creating effectively interoperability of systems, uh, because you can query the data packet itself. Instead of having all the systems communicate, you can simply query the data packet, and it can essentially tell you where it's been, what it is, where it's going, what, it, or what attributes it has. That's really interesting from a, from a system perspective. But the efficiency on the rest of it, um, I, I guess, to be honest with you, I, I don't get. I don't get. I've, I've held Bitcoin since late 2009. I would love to believe it's going to radically burn down the world. That would be to my great personal benefit. I don't, I don't see it, unfortunately. Uh, so I think, see, the way power forward is incrementalism. Um, I do see an opportunity for interchangeability of uh, the assets. Right now, when Santander issues, as last, it did last week, issued a bond on the blockchain, if you can only be bought it with crypto assets, okay, there's only 200 billion in the entire universe, and that's not enough to feed Santander's own personal debt balance sheet, part of the balance sheet. So we've got to bake the issuance. Um, we have to have an issuance process that's agnostic as to whether it actually is tokenized or whether it's in traditional form. 
that will allow larger deals to come through, which will improve the quality of deals flow through, and um, and we can result in a system that actually works instead of this archipelago of a thousand uh, Vanuatu incorporated uh, <laughs> money, money laundering scams. To be honest. I think it would be a lot easier if we, instead of having multiple jurisdictions and multiple markets and multiple standards, we just had one. That would make things a lot easier. Uh, and therefore, um, you, know, you could get some of these efficiencies you're talking about. And the reality is that you know, in, in the, in, in, certainly uh, in the time that I'm going to be on this planet, I suspect that the lawyers will be setting their own legal opinions for each jurisdiction, for their own securities, for their own areas. Uh, we'll have the governments wanting to take their different tax takes. We'll have people wanting to do their processes in slightly different ways. This is why um, uh, you know, custodian banks aren't going to go away sometime soon. Uh, you take an HSBC, for example. You know, they're in 40-odd markets around the world. Um, it, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a... Uh, just imagine if you had one of those markets that could do... Uh, could do um, was... was um, connected the issuers to the end investors in one platform. And I'm going to say, you could think of that in a block, you could think of that's a block, that could be a blockchain DLT. Also, it could be a single central database. But imagine everyone used that one platform. Then HSBC's business model would, would for, for, for that particular service line, would go away. But that's not going to go away anytime soon. You know, you've got every different market doing things in different ways. And so, you know, you get a custodian bank like an HSBC or a, or a Bank of New York Mellon or, or, or one of the big sub-custodians, probably City, and they are the ones who, who really provide that sort of glue to allow you to connect to everything. Uh, and I think their, their, their job, unfortunately, isn't going to go away sometime soon. Yeah, and, and well, that's a, I think that's the core point to me, which is the promise touted, a lot of the promise touted by DLT is that you can move the assets off the balance sheet of the custodian into you know, self-ownership on the investor level. First of all, what exactly is the demand for that? I question it. But let's say even if it happens, does the custodians go away? In my view, like there's no chance whatsoever. Portfolio managers and individual investors do not want to do the work, the service package that custodians offer. So even if you go to an ultimate beneficial ownership on a CSD level, you still have the exact same market need, from my perspective, for custodian services, even if they're actually not, meta you know, metaphorically, physically putting an item in the vault. Yeah. Uh, even without all that, they're still a, a, they're they're getting paid, not for their vault. They're getting paid for the service package they do on top of that, and the the yeah. custodianship of the asset is simply a, a me mechanism to a means to to a certain to establish certainty to be able to do that. But it's the service package, and that doesn't go away for technology yeah, or anything so, else. Uh, you know, that's absolutely right. And I think uh, you know, custodians clearly, they're providing the linkages between across different markets, and they're doing all of that, um, uh, all of that uh, for example, asset servicing to the assets, uh, as well as being the custodian of those. Yeah. So the question I would have for you, are clear. So granted, if everybody on planet Earth used you as their CSD, everything would work perfectly. Yeah, if everyone did. Everyone would. agrees here. <laughs> all right, here's the thing. That's not going to happen. No, I know, so, sadly not. No. Is there a way for us to use these technologies to create the benefit of a multi-jurisdictional 24-7 market, right, without giving you a global monopoly on all world power and the, the ring of Zaran or whatever the Lord of the Rings guy was, right? With, not, that they, not that you don't deserve it. Not that you won't, wouldn't be absolutely <laughs> responsible with all the power, but if we don't all use your, your clear, is there, an, uh, there a chance to create the benefits of an integrated global jurisdictional world, execution videos that creates the same benefits that we would if we did have a singular back end? I think the, I think the challenges will come on the, uh, on the legal constructs around those different jurisdictions and trying to get those aligned uh, would be what you would need to do. You'd have to get regulatory uh, harmonization, which to some degree you have in Europe, which is, uh, which is really good. Uh, and, and for those of you who you want to leave Europe, then you might question that's going to, what will happen to that. But, um, uh, you know, I think you know, trying to get that on a global level is just not in my lifetime, unfortunately. <laughs> but it would create efficiencies. I agree with you. I agree with you. <laughs> I might just pick up on a couple of those. And sure. um, two of our key points at WFV, I think, you've, you've said already, one is we need at least a modicum of international regulatory coherence um, to help uh, digital assets to um, 
come into the mainstream. Uh, the other thing that would help is professionalizing the exchange and custody of them. Um, and this, you know, w we cringe <laughs> at my organization when we hear um, the media call them crypto exchanges because when we uh, conceive of exchanges, they're regulated markets that have high degree of uh, market integrity, investor protection, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah, I. I I think we can take that piece as read. I might just highlight a, a few topical use cases um, that, that we're seeing at the moment. I mean, one, obviously, CME is now um, clearing crypto futures. And uh, I believe next week, ICE's new backed platform will start trading and also um, providing a warehouse for physically delivered um, Bitcoin. So I think that's an interesting development. And uh, the other piece on DLT that um, we've not alighted upon yet is the chess replacement. So um, that is uh, public information. I think this summer uh, clients have been able to start um, designing and, and testing within uh, the Australian ASX uh, environment um, in, the, in this um, DLT-driven chess replacement system. So uh, something to watch there, I think. Alex, are you involved with that at all in terms of the testing? Uh, so far, no, but we hope. I <laughs> um, just wanted to circle back to the comment made about RPA as it's um, a sticking plaster. Um, I've, we've also heard people talk about it as a stepping stone for AI. I mean, do you want to comment on that? Do you just feel that it is an end game RPA or is it, you know, this intelligent RPA, is that more of a stepping stone to using AI and, and big data analytics? I can see when you're saying about screen scraping, you're just, yeah, you're just making the integration a little bit easier. But there are other ways to use it, aren't there? Or do you disagree? Uh, I, I, th there may well be, uh, and I'd like to say that we're already doing it. Um, I can't <laughs> hear, of, I can't think of an example where we are at the moment in terms of you know using uh, a more advanced RPA and, and using artificial intelligence to try to perhaps you know th there is a degree of fitting that the RPA does. So if you're taking data from one platform, sticking it into another, there is a degree of um, uh, customization and analytics you can provide around that. But I've not seen the AI aspect coming into that yet. Okay. Have you seen much AI, really? Because we've done a number of surveys at Tab, and while there's a lot of excitement about it, the actual spend is still fairly constrained, which indicates to us these aren't real enterprise solutions. Just quick, um, any thoughts from that on the panel? How real is AI? At the well, I think I think I think if you look at if you look at I think that the space that we see it in, uh, perhaps the most uh, the most obvious, is, is in the cybersecurity space. Okay. That's where you see certain providers providing. Well, what's really you know, uh, it, it, it's on the verge of machine learning. It's probably very very advanced analytics, but it's looking at, for example, how data is transferred across networks and looking at uh, any anomalies to that transfer of data. So looking at network connect connectivities, looking at all your endpoints in an organization, uh, trying to preempt based upon pre-prescribed rules, based upon some machine learning uh, of your own particular network, what is going on. So a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the, um, you, know, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of the tools that are out there today, uh, some of which we use um, uh, are, you know, are really quite, quite, you know, actually probably quite the most advanced in terms of the AI tool, the AI angle that we're using at the moment. Yeah, I guess cyber fraud, that's, that's yeah. those are really good applications. Yeah, that's right. Um, we see some applications in machine-based learning on it. AI is a fairly broad term, but the NBL stuff is pretty straightforward on it. The challenge we're seeing on the AI and all the whole category of AI in terms of, so it works in terms of developing trading algorithms and trading uh, strategies. There's a very qual big qualitative gap, though, or line on the other side when it starts using AI technologies, all of them, a whole family of AI technologies, in terms of determining access to capital. Because suddenly you have social policies getting in there involved. Who gets a credit card? Who gets you know, a stock transfer or whatever? And if you don't have some ability to come in and explain how the That's engine right. is working, right. then you have a, an, an a inherent qualification a clash with social policy. So uh, we're trying to out, there are a lot of, uh, you know, the latest phrase, explainable AI, which still can't be explained to me. Yeah. Uh, but, but you have some, anytime you're gonna have a black box with a dynamic scoring engine on it that's constantly adapting, uh, works fine in the private for individual trader, 
when it comes to capital access with any kind of public interest involved, there's a bright line there that a lot of the firms are not willing to cross yet because we don't have any kind of regulatory guidance. On. That's absolutely right. I think it's the regulatory guidance that's lacking and also you know, the legal challenges that will come out of that. Um, I, I attend something called the All, the All Party Parliamentary Group on AI. I'm part of that. And um, that was one of the very, very, one of the topics that we had a, we had a long discussion on. Uh, it, it's really around you know, how can you prove it? In a regulated environment, what can you do? And the regulate, we, we are we are really waiting for the regulators, not just in financial services, but across all industries. You know, we'd, we we really need to. You know, it's going to take some time coming. Uh, who knows what blow-ups will be in the meantime? Uh, but uh, it's that's a really interesting, interesting, interesting point actually. Yeah, actually, I did want to talk about regulations. So that's a perfect segue. Um, I don't know if we can come back to that side of the panel a bit as well, Richard. I don't know if you've done any work with your members looking at how the regulatory picture affects the use of these technologies. Um, you know, at TAB, when we do talk to the industry about use of various technologies, the lack of regulatory clarity comes up again and again, and especially because a lot of these companies are multi-jurisdiction. We've already heard some comments about that, how with specific technologies that can be a problem. Yeah, I mean, I can only echo what's been said. I think that, you know, there are big challenges to uh, artificial intelligence if it you know it sets a, a hair off in one direction and you don't know where it's going and then it turns out it's gone somewhere that is against um, you know wider social policy objectives public policy objectives um, and I think that you know this isn't limited to financial services just yesterday we saw the police coming out saying you know we're concerned about deploying artificial intelligence ourselves because um, it can you know exacerbate um, uh, bad outcomes that uh, that happen. Um, so I think that it's something that uh, we have to work very closely with the regulators uh, on. I think um, testing is also going to be a big part of this. I mean, uh, perhaps you have some uh, thinking about where testing can bring the regulators on board in an iterative way. Well, um, I believe that yeah, yes, that. Uh, the artificial intelligence are the methods that are used everywhere in other industries, like an in internet search, for example. So it should be used in the appropriate places in financial industries, and it must be tested. Uh, this other industries used this artificial intelligence successfully, and therefore they tested successfully, and therefore they have all these techniques uh, for testing, analyzing them. So I have a rel relatives who work in this industry who was exactly doing this, testing the search engine capabilities, and they have methods and they have capabilities of testing this. Mm. It just needs to be formulated, and I think the regulators should adopt that as, as, as a part of the financial industry. Yeah, so one of the use cases that I've seen is on the surveillance side and using artificial intelligence. I mean, I think we can debate where exactly it will fit in there, but to monitor trader communications, for example. Um, so I think that is a, a use case that we see with us now. Um, also, uh, you know, supposedly there's a lot of this going on in the asset management sector um, to determine investment outcomes. Um, so I think that it is a uh, not something that uh, we can shy away from uh, because there are you know potential challenges but we have to uh, you know be very mindful of, of the regulatory environment and uh, anticipate uh, public policy needs in a certain way even when it comes to you know mature technology so on Rob's slide with all the different technologies he had cloud in the mature category but when we speak to you know certain entities in the financial industry they still, are nervous about putting certain data sets in the cloud because of regulatory issues. So this isn't just an issue with the most cutting edge. Um, there's almost a sense sometimes that the regulators are having trouble keeping up. I mean, I do you think that's fair in, in the people that have worked with the regulators? I think the, regu I mean, the regulators are, are very um, challenged in terms of you know, everything they're trying to cover with the resources they've got available. Uh, I think you know, cloud is a prime example. I mean, I think you know, cloud is something that is, for example, on the you know, the SCA talks about it, the Bank of England talks about it, uh, the policies are still not that clear. For a regulated CSD in the, in the UK, uh, it is at this point in time very difficult to put your data into a cloud environment to satisfy your regulatory obligations. And there's specific regulations that are preventing you from doing 
that, or you just feel there isn't the general clarity? Um, there are specific regulations. I'm afraid I'm not the regulatory expert, right, so I can't okay. tell you which ones they are. But, uh, <laughs> but some of my colleagues will be able to point you to that it, one. You know, can you uh, put it into buckets at all? Uh, it, it, it's about it's about it's about um, it's about data privacy. It's about reliability, and it's about being able to um, uh, demonstrate that you are in control of your data yeah. okay. uh, when you're integrating when you're using a third party. Yeah. And that's the challenge. I think. Yeah, I think that is um, going to be an area of increasing focus, this vendor risk management, actually. And um, uh, I th financial services regulators will not feel themselves in a position to say, well, it, it's not inside our regulatory perimeter to look at AWS or so yeah. forth. If there's a systemic implication about um, these folks going down, they need to you know, be looking yeah. at that. Okay, well, I, we are getting towards the end, so I just wanted to ask a last question about looking towards the future. Um, do we predict radical disruption, or will this be um, incremental change? I think I'll know what the answer is, but we'll start uh, <laughs> over here, am I right? Um, well, it, depend, it depends what sort of lens was, you know, it depends how one's looking at it, but I, I think, um, you know, there's going to be, there's clearly going to be some incremental change going on. Uh, we're going to incrementally get better at our, at our data analytics. We're going to incrementally use more machine learning. We're going to use more intelligence in our cybersecurity. Um, but then, if you look at some of the sort of questions that were being perhaps posed or discussed earlier around, you know, about around what fundamentally is going to change with regards to, let's say, trading, clearing, and settlement. Well, there, I think you've got to look at the. Uh, you, there, there, I think you've got to take into consideration of what um, what you're splitting up. Because if today, let's say, so one classic case, one very interesting and a very uh, uh, interesting sort of example in the marketplace today, the Bank of England is starting, has started a program to replace its real-time growth settlement platform. This is the, the platform that the banks use, all the banks use, the settlement banks use to connect to the Bank of England. This is where all the large amounts of money in, the, in this country are moved around, the real-time growth settlement system. It's an, older, it's an older system. It has some functional flaws with it, should we say, and that's, get, and that's being replaced. And um, as part of that replacement, in the, I think, third or fourth phase, there is some consideration to, well, actually, we've got central bank money, which is very, very important. In what, uh, today, that's only provided by the central bank in Euroclear. Uh, and CHAPS and the different payment regulators. So CHAPS, Central Bank, uh, Euroclear. Uh, and in the future, um, they want to, the bank is looking to the future from a technology perspective and saying, we will extend that to certain new business networks. Some of those business networks may be DLT networks. We're not quite sure, but we're going to extend it to new business networks. And I think for me, that's very interesting because you know, that means there's opportunities for people to get access to central bank money. Five, ten, you know, five, six years hence, which is which which is a very cheap source of money, and that will be a potential game changer. But is the bank ever going to want to split up its liquidity? Mm. It will perhaps provide it at the edge, but it will be a real game changer, a real um, you know uh, perhaps uh, leap if they were to open that up completely, because then the liquidity in the central bank could rapidly deteriorate. Sure. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of external so drivers. A lot that, of external drivers. Yeah, I mean, but it, Europe it, it, and... <laughs> I, I'd say, you know, think about the market, think about what you've got, liquidity. Currently, you've got 100% liquidity in that market. If you split that up, what's yeah. it going to do? Market fragmentation is probably not a great thing, necessarily. Okay, so thanks, Alex. Um, John, moving to you, we really are running out of time, so the 30-second answer for <laughs> each of yeah. you now. I mean, for my end, there's two issues, two big issues that we're going to have to wrestle with as a global industry. One is, are we going to shift to a, a real-time processing on a transaction-by-transaction transaction basis instead of our current batch and netting process? I'm, I'm not convinced that the answer is going to be the same for all asset classes. So we're going to have to wrestle with that. Secondly, um, with all, as much as the world would be better off if we all gave all our business to Euroclear and just gave them one ring to rule them all, I think we're going to have to figure out a way as an industry, to global industry, to achieve 24-7 um, multi-jurisdictional capital markets without having one exchange or one back-end program ruling all over it. So interoperability, I think there's clearly a global capital markets demand. Um, our current model of 
an exchange by nation state, by asset class, by limited hours per day is, is just not going to match up with global demand for capital markets, globalization. Yeah, so I think... And I don't know how to solve that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. For an answer I from hear you. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to be both um, in the sense that we will be seeing some radical disruption of our processes, um, but what I don't see is a radical disruption to the incumbents um, that, that we have. At the end of the day, uh, you need a license to operate in securities markets. Um, you need to be trusted for market integrity. Um, and so th that's not going to change as long as we have regulators looking out for us. You know, Along the edges, there may be some new entrants, of course, but we're not going to see the you know, system fall down by a couple guys in their garage. <laughs> Alexi. Yep, I agree that there will be both incremental changes and radical, radical changes, and I believe that we will have a lot of things to test in our company. <laughs> I think that's probably true. Yeah. Okay, with that, I just uh, I'm going to thank uh, Alex, John, uh, Richard, and Alexi for that very interesting discussion. Thank you all. <laughs>